here by the strength of humankind. We don't know if that was voluntary or slave labour. It could have been either. So, like I said, there's an awful lot. So it's got a north entrance and a south entrance. We know that um, some of the stones represent... All the stones are upright. And this is the biggest in Europe. It is not the oldest. This one's 5,000 years old. The oldest is actually in Turkey. That's nearly 100,000 years old. And that's where Stone Circle buildings are. They came right across Europe. And Britain was actually one of the last places to start. So, a little bit about what you're seeing here. Uh, it's a little bit different, difficult. So, I'm going to do this. Slowly. Okay? So, you've got a very rounded left hand side. And then you've got a sh very sharp edge to its right hand side. Look behind you at Blencathra. Behind that stone is exactly the same shape. It's got this rounded left hand side and then a very sharp edge that comes out. And that stone represents Blencathra. If you look to where that gentleman's just stood in front of it, you can see there's a stone there that's got a, an angle on top and it's got a slight raise in it. Skidoy in the distance there. Skidoy is exactly the same shape. It's the same angle and it's got that little lump that just sticks up. And that one represents Skidoy. That's the third highest peak in the Lake District. Behind us, and I suspect we want to call the cat. Very scale. First to say that, but look at the very far mountain that you can see there. It is exactly the same angle. That's El Valley. That's the second highest peak of the lake. Over to your right, well we've seen cat bells already today. But if you think about those four humps that I was mentioning when I was talking about Mrs. Tiggywinkle, yeah. we've got a very big one there, comes down and it raises up, comes down and raises up, and goes down and raises up again. And cat bells is represented by these four stones. The one to your left, well, we can't see the tallest peak here in the from here. But the tallest peak is Scarfell and Scarfell Pike. What we can see is Great End, the very large mountain that we can see in the distance. Behind that is Scarfell Pike. And this stone to the left of Glen Ca of uh, Cat Bell's representation, that is the same shape as um, Scaffell Pike, which you can't even see from here. Now that's a heck of an achievement 5,000 years ago. How on earth did they know that the highest peak was up there? Lots of the other stones represent other fells in the background. The only ones I'm pointing out are the ones that are obvious and you can actually see for yourself. Yeah. Uh, but like I say, if you did try and line them up, you will find a lot of the stones represent the uh, shape of the fells that are just behind them. Okay, now, this little ring of stones, this yeah. was added later, it's called the Sanctuary. Nobody knows why, they just know it came along a bit later. Uh, now, I've got a personal theory on this, and this is not scientific, this is not proven, but look at that big stone behind you. I think it looks a little bit like a chair. And if you want to sit in it, you can actually support your back in it like a chair would. And I think it's where the chieftain of the valley would have sat. And he would have given instructions to his lesser men. They would have sat according to the rank in the valley. Now somebody said to me the other day that well it must be very comfortable. One stone in the There's a stone right over there by the wall. Ladies just to leave from there. Just next to the stile, there is actually another stone. Originally, this is the town. If you stand at the centre of the stone and you summon up your inner calm, your inner peace, you will eventually feel the vibrations of Mother Earth in your body. I've done it many, many times. I've only felt it once. And then I found out my mobile phone was ringing. 
Fleeces were brought uh, before they were taken away to market. Uh, this uh, ceased to be a railway in about 1976 and it was actually dismantled. They are talking about trying to rebuild it, but the, uh, the cost of doing that is probably prohibitive. But uh, like I said, there is a campaign to bring the railway back. But the railway ran between Penrith and uh, Keswick because of William Wordsworth. I said before, William was a great campaigner about what he thought was right and wrong. And the original proposal for the railway was to run from Windermere all the way through to Keswick, going through Ambleside, Grasmere, Rydal, uh, up to Dunmail Rays, and it is quite beautiful. Like I said, the way the fells just rise up all the way until you get to the sky it really is quite special. It's an unusual lake because it is S-shaped. Uh, most of the lakes in the Lake District are um, just a straight line. This one has got a little bit of a kink in it. And that was created, which isn't anywhere that's safe to do that. But uh, like I say, we will pull over the Glen Reading at the very side of the lake. with having cast out or oh, kids are waving at us there I'll just get my way back but um, he was also credited with having cast out all the serpents from the island of Ireland now Ireland doesn't have any snakes on it but I've got a feeling the actual references when it says serpents it means sin so he cast out all sin from the island and that's how eventually he became the patron saint but he rose through the ranks of the clergy and eventually he was to become a bishop and as a bishop he was summoned to a meeting in Glastonbury in the, the south of England and to get from Ireland to Glastonbury well the easiest way to do it was to sail across the sea between what is now uh, Larne and Stranra it used to be called Broadwater now I mentioned earlier that uh, this was one of the skaters lakes it's uh, connected with that as to how its name was changed. But Broadwater, well, we have a saying in the north of England that something is as broad as it is long. Meaning, whichever way you look at it, it looks exactly the same. And uh, that is what you could use to describe Broadwater. Because it's a spin-off. 
And the reason they're called dry stone walls is there's nothing gluing them together. There's no mortar in them, there's no mud packed into them or anything like that. It is purely the size, shape and placement of the stone that keeps them in one place. It's like building a jigsaw puzzle, if you will. Everything must be the right size, the right shape and in the right place. And these walls are incredibly strong. Uh, they will actually last an incredible amount of time, maybe 250 to 300 years. Uh, some of the very oldest can be traced back perhaps to 500 years ago. So they do last an awful long time. And they're perfect. It doesn't undermine anything that's holding the wall together. It just passes straight through. Earlier in the day, I said, have a look at the sheep that was lined up against the wall, sheltering from the worst of the weather. That's another feature of these walls that makes them perfect because if that was in winter and the weather had turned very cold and wintry and we started to get snow, well that particular herd we could get buried. But as long as she's close to the wall, she'll be fine because there's air coming through because there's always air gaps in these walls. So again, it's perfect for our sheep as well. And when we get very cold weather like that and the ground freezes, well, when ground freezes, it expands. And when, the wall, when it expands, it moves the wall out of shape slightly. Eventually, with a mortared wall, that would crack and fall to pieces. But with these, all you do is wait for the uh, ground to thaw out and they just settle back down into the exact same position. And like I said, it's what makes them perfect. And if you're wondering who started it all, it was the Vikings. Because after they cleared the land of wood, they also had to clear it of stone. Because the glaciers left behind a huge amount of rubble. And you had to clear the land before you could start farming. And once they cleared the land, they had to find something to do with all the stone they'd moved. And they used to build something called a ring vault. A ring vault was a... Um, wall built around the valley. Uh, the idea was you could grow, grow your crops uh, at the, on the valley floor and then the wall would keep your livestock on the higher ground away from what you're trying to grow. So that's how it all started. Now we still build the walls in just about the same way as we used to then. So over a thousand years and we're still building these walls the same way. Of a church. It's got a pointed top and they thought it looked like a church, or a kirk, as it's called in Scotland. And that's how the kirk stone got its name. The word pass just means a route between two mountains. Uh, and that's uh, what we're travelling on now. Now the kirk stone is going to be at eye level, on to the, the front right of the bus as we climb up.
it is a little bit bumpy in here, so please watch your heads uh, on the glass. You don't want to be back in your head. Here we go. It's our last photo stop, and it's not a bad one, is it? Let's have a look at that. That's the Patterdale Valley, and you can see the square shape of the club. Not the place I would have done a U-turn myself, but there you go. But if you look at this road down to your right-hand side, you can see the, the curvy nature at this end. At the other end is exactly the same, but even a little bit steeper. Uh, and like I say, you will uh, you will see. You won't see it up from here, but like I said, that's the bit that used to tire the, ho the horses out as they started their climb. Beatrix 
to be the first lady presidents, that their daughters were as valuable as their sons, because it was always thought that the sons were of far greater value to a farming family. And all of a sudden, women were welcome out on the fells. And today, believe it or not, many of our most successful hill farmers are actually women. Uh, and this is all down to the legacy of Beatrix Potter, the fact that she changed farming here in the Lake District forever. Couple that to her friend, Hardwick Rawnsley, who went out of his way to ensure that places stayed the same. He established the National Trust, whose sole remit is to ensure that our historic homes, landscapes and coastline stay preserved for future generations. And those two people are mostly responsible for what you see around you today. Without them, this place could have been developed. Those 14 farms could all have been built by developers who wanted to build holiday homes. Instead, they're still farms today. The very places like Castle Rick Stone Circle could so easily have been uh, destroyed, apart from the actions of the people like Hardwick Rawnsley. Like I say, we owe a huge debt to those two people. And if anybody tells you that one person can't make a difference, well, those two individuals certainly did. Open your right hand.